Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kim Sher. We're going to talk a little bit about custody evaluations and how that affects with uh, uh, Miners Council and a little bit about how COVID has had a play in all of what we're doing these days. So to start off with, let's talk a little bit about some of the mental illnesses that are being recorded right now as far as going on in our country. And you can see from the uh, little uh, chart here that there are lots of different uh, things that happen. We got eating disorders, depression, substance abuse, post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, attention deficit, bipolar. We have lots of different things going on in this. I, the one about the eating disorders, we're renaming COVID-19 to COVID-20 because of the 20 pounds that we've all maybe gained. All right, let's talk for me. Uh, not anybody else on that one. So the issue is, is that we've got lots of different things that have been occurring. The challenge is, is that the police records and things are not showing what's really going on in the world right now because they're not showing any spikes in anything. As far as the suicide rate, we all thought that that was, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, going higher and higher. It seems to be staying steady in some of the studies that I've looked at. Um, so as clearly, I'm not sure is that the research is not, you know, catching up with what's really going on. Remember those psychology people came up with that idea that, uh, you know, sugar doesn't affect kids, right? right? I don't think they had any kids in the study, I think is a problem in that one, right? So... You know, sometimes research doesn't actually measure what's going on in reality. As we've all seen, I think, uh, at least in my practice, people are a lot sicker than they used to be. They're, by the time they get into my office, they, they've gone through the mill a few times. Uh, so uh, let's see if we can move on and see how this is sort of playing into the custody evaluations parts. So when you think about it, is, is who's the client and who's the consumer in an in, in, in evaluation? Um, I try to explain this to, to people that come into my office uh, is, is that I am hired primarily by the attorneys. I'm paid for by the parents and I report to the judge. So it's a really convoluted group of people that, you know, you know, that I'm involved with here and who's on, who's on first and all that kind of means, uh, makes it a little bit different. Um, and so the idea is, is that what, what we're going to do is, 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 uh, judge Wells has said in previously is, is that in most cases they, in court, they have about six minutes per case. That's not a lot of time to be able to figure out what's going on, who's on first and how they got where they are. So that's where I think the custody evaluation becomes in and helps out. Because uh, even as minor counsel, you only have some limited resources of what you can be able to do. You don't have 50 hours to go spend just trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I just did probably one of the largest cases that I've done in a long time. I was at over 100 hours involved with this group. Um, highly complex situation, uh, trying to come up with what's in the best interest of the child. Of course, I probably won't be receiving... Christmas cards from several of the people involved in that, but that's, that's okay. That, that's kind of a norm. Um, so when you think about is, is in custody evaluations, it's not something that gets a, a, a fly by the seat of your pants. There is uh, several models of standards that exist out there. The AFCC, the a, uh, American Psychological Association all have different standards, kind of pretty much the same about what an evaluator needs needs to be able to do to re maintain some objectivity in this because the key is is that you don't want to be able to come out with something that's just biased and you have uh, I mean I've heard of evaluators that have basically one report and they just change the names on it you know but that's not what we want to be able to have uh, we need to have something that's going to be related to what's going on with the family and how we can be able to help them the best you know so we end up looking at what how you can get involved with uh, biases you know, it's very easy to become biased. Um, usually biasing is not a uh, something you think about, you know, like um, what mainstream media is all telling us about. It's more about things that are a lot more subtle than that. It may be a gender bias. You know, you could be that you're a guy, you feel that's the way it should be. Or you're a girl and you feel that's the way it should be. You know, the, the history of, of evaluations and what's gone on with custody has changed drastically over the last hundred years. 
you know. And you think about it, it's gone from one side of the pendulum all the way to the other side, and you know, and it kind of goes vacillates back and forth, and and we've now come up with the idea that you know it's what's in the child's best interest, and we'll talk a little bit later that uh, both groups feel that's not right in some ways, and so then there's a cultural bias that could be related to that people have different cultures that 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 you're not familiar with, or maybe it's a pride. who talked to you first, who talked to you last. Uh, it's very easy. I know that, you know, when, when I do some evaluations is, is that I'll listen to one person. I'll go, wow, I, there's a whole answer right there. Then there's another person. Well, that wasn't the answer. That was over here. And you can, you, you can go back and forth and all of that about where is it because you're allowing yourself to be swayed and not looking at it objectively. And it's difficult to make sure you do that. Or there's a confirmatory bias. Maybe you believe that people are, that are short have, you know, certain problems or something, uh, you know, or they, they have red hair. Oh, well, that's all the difference in the world. Um, and that you then start writing exactly about how that can be the, what's going on in the case. And then as we were all sort of raised and talked about was is the truth lies somewhere in the middle, right? There's three sides to every story. So, or how about it? There's a, a part where it moves towards, you know, towards the center. It's always trying to, you know, it's a, a moving target. And a lot of times, I think, you know, doing some of these evaluations can feel like, you know, you're trying to nail Jello to a tree, you know, of, of what's going on, who's doing what. And so, when we start looking at what's in the best interest of the child. It, it seems like a very broad topic at that point. We need to have better definitions of what that is, and they've come up with some definitions about how that works. But most of them, you know, bef in in the media, it gets politicized. We have groups on the right. We have groups on the left. I shouldn't even say right or left. They're basically just one or father's groups, one or mother's groups, and they all have their opinion about the best interest of the child. doesn't work for either one of them. Well, it must be working for somebody. Uh, I'm not sure, but I guess I think it is. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what that is, and we get all get emailed. I, they keep wanting me to go talk at some of them, and I refuse to go do that. I don't want to get caught in that political quagmire. I, have, I can get enough trouble without that. Um, so when we start thinking about the best interest of the child, it can be related. It's related to nurturing, guidance, religion, economic issues, emotional attachment, stability, and the maintenance of a healthy relationship with both parents. I think that's a very key principle. Because it took mostly, most cases, it took both of them to get involved in making this child. So I think it's important that both of them are involved in raising the child, unless there's some other issues that need to be filtered out and that, that one of the parents shouldn't be involved uh, or should have limited involvement. So those are some of the, the the definitions of it. So we start looking at is is that how do we start looking at getting to that information? So as we think about it, is is that it becomes important to have multiple avenues of gathering data. And I'll talk a lot about multiple you know uh, streams of data uh, as a very important thing because I think if you just end up relying on one stream of data, you are falling into that biasing program because it becomes very easy to be biased. If you just listen to what the parents tell you, one parent will be much better at communicating than the other parent. Just tends to be that's kind of how it works. One parent will be much better at, you know, data. They all, they know dates and times and the moments and exactly what what clothes they were wearing at that time or something. And the other parents have not got a clue where even what planet they were on at the time, you know. That, that's and and that can be sway what you're thinking. So if you have just if you're just relying on that, you're going to be basing your judgments on one thing or another where you need to be looking at multiple things going on. What does what the, uh, uh, you know, the family members think? Or what do the other professionals involved think? What did they see? You know, uh, how many times did uh, that parent A actually show up at the doctor's office? Oh, I was always involved with my kid. Okay. So you, you're talking to the primary care doctor, the pediatrician and all that. That's who? No, never seen that person. No, only X came. No, that B never showed up. It's an interesting part of facts, you know, that you're putting into, you're looking at what, how that all kind of plays together. So as we start thinking about, okay, so how do you do go on conducting an evaluation? Uh, I tend to do uh, the Columbo program as I play a bumbling idiot, which is not very difficult for me to do. Um, <laughs> But what I'm trying to do is, is is get them to relay information that they normally wouldn't do that. And also it's to make them feel comfortable about being where they are. Because 
part of what we what we do in my office is is that I send out parent packs. I send out information to them to tell them this is how the process is going to go. This is what we're going to do. And I send that out to the attorneys as well. The reason I do that is, is because this is a highly stressful situation for most people. Most people see it as, as beyond life and death, I think, you know. And so I'm trying to make it as reduce the stress level a little bit. And maybe I can get them to function in a normal way that they would function instead of the stressed out model where they make mistakes like I do when I'm stressed out, you know. Um, so that's sort of what I try to do that. So when the contact with them, you know, initially I'm asking them how the different things work and, and all that, making the appointments and doing all that. And the idea in all that is, is to try to find out what the strengths and weaknesses are. I see my, my job as to figure out what the strengths and weaknesses of both parents are and figure out how to use those to create high functioning kids. And I tell, I, I, I tell them that I'm biased from the beginning that I want to create high functioning kids. Uh, and so far, no one's complained too much about it. No one's turned me into the board or anything yet. Um, but the idea is, is that most parents want to just be heard. They feel that, you know, that six minutes they get in court is not worthwhile. Uh, you know, they, they have a whole lot more to go on. And um, so they want to be able to be heard. I tell people in the beginning, I says, we're going to have this conversation. We're going to go for a couple hours today. And if you're like everybody else that I've talked to, you're going to have a flat-headed moment when we get off the phone. You're going to, oh, I should have told him that. Oh, why didn't I tell him that? So I tell him, I said, we're not, this is not the only time we're going to talk. So what I want you to do is, is write down those things after we get off the phone instead of beating your head so much. And so that we'll go over those the next time we get together and we talk. Uh, now, the nice part is, is that we can do, a, we've learned through the COVID experience that we can do this by Zoom. Um, and that works pretty well in doing clinical interviews for people. I've actually even had a person that showed up to a clinical interview on the Zoom. He was wearing a suit and tie. And I'm thinking, wow, I wasn't wearing a suit and tie. I really felt underdressed at that moment, you know. But the idea was is that, you know, he was really wanting to make sure that he put a good first impression out there, you know. And so he understood it, and that that's good. I mean, I think at least he, that's somebody who's trying, right, you know. And I think that one of the things that we uh, – that I have to keep in mind is somebody wouldn't go through this stress and the cost that it all cost if it wasn't somewhat important to them. Now, there are a few people that money doesn't mean anything to, but and most people, that's a big deal. I want to also look at what the psychological functioning of them is or the emotional intelligence. Some people don't have very much, you know, EQ, right? So that everything's a drama. We, we see that a lot in our therapy rooms and stuff like that. And I'm sure as his minor's counsel, you get to see that happening when they, they break down and, and, and it's over a hangnail or, or something. You're going, what, what was that about? Okay. Yeah, he was 15 minutes late at the pickup. What, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, what, what, what is a rational solution to that? You know, figure out that they, you know, just show up 15 minutes late too. I don't know. You know. So then we look at, you know, when we go beyond that, I try talking to the people about what's their ch children's needs and trying to figure out that. Because a lot of times I don't think they have a good understanding of what the children's needs are. A lot of times they can tell me about their needs, that they the child needs me, they need a father, they need this, they need that. But they don't have don't understand what the children's needs are. So I, I typically do things that I'm sure that most Myers counsel do also, is I ask them about who's their child's best friend. You know, what's their favorite food? Um, you know, you ask things that if you're not around, you're not going to, you wouldn't know existed. You know, what time does class start? You know, and a lot of them don't have a clue. And it doesn't matter what sex it is. It's just, they just don't have a clue because they weren't that involved in, with the raising of the child. So we have to look at somewhat what kind of what that information is. And so now we get to that part where, what do you believe, right? Who's telling you the truth? And maybe they're both telling you the truth. Maybe the answer really doesn't lie in the middle between the two of them, but their truth is from through their own eyes and how they see it. So that's where that Columbo part shows up and, you know, trying to get more information that you wouldn't normally get from somebody. And then you start looking at other streams of data, like the collaterals. Now, I think friends, you know, people always give me the list of their friends, right? Are there collaterals there? 
I think the only time that those become relevant is is when the, the friends give you a bad report of that parent, right? Otherwise, if your friend doesn't call, call up and tell you, this is the greatest person since sliced bread, you know, they can walk on water, uh, then, then I'm going to be questioning, why would they be doing that? You know? Now, I have had a few ones that, uh, you know, I had one call up a, a parent and say, I'm really glad this is going on because I've never seen my kid act so responsible. That was the grandparent talking about one of the parents. Oh, oh that's an interesting thing. So... Um, so we start looking at the well, I, I, part that I do a lot of is a psychological testing. I have a very, uh, person who's been a very dear friend of mine, one of the premier child custody evaluating people who do psychological testing, Dr. Hoppy, who's a good friend of mine, who has sort of, uh, mentored me and taught me the fine arts of psych testing and all that. But so as you look at what, what you get out of that, you start seeing the, the intricacies of how complex human nature is and how, how do they handle things and how do they deal with life issues and stuff? And how does that going to fit in in dealing with, you know, being a parent and raising a child? So I, I look a lot at, and I'm, which I'm sure the, the, uh, uh, the judges do and all minor counsel does is, is what are they complaining about? That's a good indication of what their emotional intelligence is, right? So as we start looking at it, so we start thinking, let me go back and just deal with the psych testing. Um, you know, psych testing, when people wonder, well, does it actually, you get anything? Well, psych testing's predictability is is better than Viagra. Okay. I usually get a bigger laugh out of that one, but you know, I told you I needed to re rehash some of these jokes here, you know? So, you know, it's the the testing gives you a, a much clearer picture, and it's very predictive of how people are going to do. Now, lots of people try to you can go online and you know and try to figure out how you can you know uh, you know fix the test. Sort of what you know they, how how can I cheat on this test and all that and uh, you know people everybody always is trying to come up with a shortcut right in some ways. Part of you know the thing is is that when you're doing the testing, you have to make sure that it's done properly. One of the things that a lot of people who have done testing, I think, they don't realize that the norms only exist under certain requirements. And if those requirements aren't met, then the norms are not valid. And so that's one way that, that sometimes people that do testing that don't really know what they're doing about testing, that their data gets thrown out and their reports get thrown out because you can't rely on that data because it wasn't done in the proper way, right? So... As we're looking at these complex natures and relationships that are going on, we need to figure out how we can come up with something that's going to work. So what are the benefits of some of this stuff? So you, you get to see how they people think, how they start to associate different things with one another. You know, are they a t type of person who has a, an addictive personality? You know, do you, do you see that in there? They, do they tend to, to do those kinds of things? And you have the parent who's sitting there telling you about how that he thinks it's perfectly okay to smoke pot 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't quite say it in that. Oh, then, I don't know. Some of them do. <laughs> well, you know, and, and so when you, when you and, and there, then the rationale for that is it's legal, right? But so is alcohol, isn't it? The last time I checked, it was illegal too. So if, but you can't drive a car when you've been drinking, right? So if you can't drive a car when you've been drinking, you probably, you know, California and all the other states also have laws about that if you're, you're stoned, you can't drive the car either, right? So, and they've come up with numerical values. And I'm an advocate of saying that oh, that same numerical value, if you can't drive a car, should be applied to you being happy spending time with the child. Yep. Uh, so I think that that's, I, I think, a way of looking at it. Even though it's legal, that doesn't mean that's in the best interest of the child. You know? Because what are they going to do when they're, when, when they're uh, intoxicated of one form or another? Are they going to be a... a a role model of, of being a parent or are they typically going to, I, I look at, you know, all of those types of things is they're trying to alter their reality, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's with alcohol, drugs or whatever. So they're altering their reality. So they want to go live in this other reality for a while and the kid's not invited or children, right? So the kid is now going to be off on its own with virtually no supervision whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a healthy way of doing that. 
That's like saying I'm going to I'm going to go to the store, leave the kid there for you know the next six days, and uh, well, maybe I should give it to let the other parent be in charge at that point. Mm-hmm. So um, that's what some of what we're going to do. So we look at the different kind of tests. I, I, most people know what the different tests are that kind of exist out there. I just give a little cursory thing. We have objective tests. The big ones are the MMPI and the MCMI, which I think are the two biggest ones. We have projective tests out there, like the Rorschach, which everyone's heard of the ink blots, right? And uh, then we have some ones specifically designed for custody evaluations that don't have that good of validity, but they they show some interesting signs, you know, and in, in how people do. So there's the parenting inventories, and we have tests for kids. I don't test kids too much anymore. I don't find it to be really that valuable. I think that my instincts are as good as is is doing the the testing unless you have some strange things that are going on when you have some you know highly special need kids, then maybe some of that needs to be done um a lot of times i i I farm that out to somebody else to do because i'm not I don't do kids that much anymore as far as testing you know, and they keep changing the test you know Pearson has a big corporation it needs to get make more money so they have to come up with a new test you know every couple of years right i mean we have need, now need the mmpi3 mm. two wasn't good enough so we have to go to the three now so the ones that i usually use are the mmpi and the mcmi the mci now this is an older slide it says three now we now have the four uh again pearson is doing their best job helping us here um so does everybody kind of know how the MMPI came around a little bit? So I'll talk a little bit about it. The MMPI is probably the most used test in existence. We have more research on that test than any other test, I think, in human existence. Okay. Um, the reason it got that way is when it was originally designed for hospital use and all that, the military in World War II decided that, uh, hey, can we, can we, could you guys come over and use that a little bit? So millions and millions of people were all evaluated using MMPI back in the day. And so, and it's, and it's been off and running ever since. So we have, uh, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't even venture again, a hundred million people that have gone through that, that test and, we have researchers who that's all they do is sit around figuring out how to correlate different things with the different scales that exist within it. Um, nowadays it's so it's not, it's not normed. There's, there's a couple different testing or scoring companies out there. There is the uh, Codwell who's back in existence. I think he's passed away, but they've opened back up. And then there's the Pearson one. Pearson tends to show people a little more um, not as not that sick it somewhat underestimates, whereas Codwell tends to overestimate, and they tend to look a lot sicker. So if you're 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 looking at somebody who's done testing, you want to, they should be stated in their report where they they did the scoring, so because that will make it look differently. Okay, um, and most people, what they uh, unfortunately have done is is they uh, have a computer program that does the scoring, and so they copy and paste from the computer printout. And that's really not how it's designed to be done, you know. Uh, is is like in the MCMI, they do that, and you know they'll talk about one scale. Well, if you read the book, the, you know, like the instruction booklet that comes with it, is is it talks about you're supposed to be looking at all three different kinds of scales and using the correlation between the scales, not just looking at one scale of it. Okay, and I think an appropriate, uh, you know, uh, report should also show you the raw data. So all of my reports always show the raw data so that if somebody wants to go back and reanalyze my data, you, you're you free to do that. You don't have to subpoena anything. It's right there in the report. Um, on the um, So you, the MCMI is looking more at personality traits, so you're looking at how their personality sort of functions a little bit more. The MMPI is looking at more of the chronic situation, which you can see if you start looking at some of the uh, the, the clinical scales and the content scales and how they interact with one another, you start to see how people deal with issues and how the parts that they don't tell you, you know, like you see that the part that, you know, that they have somewhat of an addictive personality, let's say, we're just talking about that and how that sort of plays in. And so, and they're the one telling you that it's okay for them to smoke all the time. I, yeah, I smoke daily, no problem. It's legal, you know. Uh, and, and they go on about that. And you go, you know, at that point, when you start looking at the testing data, that you probably have a problem that needs to be looked at. 
And so you start to have to look at some of those issues that goes in there. So then uh, the projectives has the Rorschach, the TAT. Uh, uh, you know, on the East Coast, I think the Rorschach is used a lot more than it is on the West Coast. We have this casual way, you know, where I'm not even wearing a coat and tie today. So, um, you know, we just, Rorschach is very difficult to score. Unless you are, you know, somebody who do, does it all the time, you're going to come up with false answers. Well, it can be if you are not somebody who does it, you know, if you're not doing it like every week, you know, uh, it, it, you're going to have more troubles with it because it, it, it's, there's intricacies of it, which that be, if you don't know about them, make it more subjective. Yeah. Exactly. And that's exactly, so if I was to go do one, even though I've trained in how to do that, that nowadays if I did it, it would be very subjective, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It'd be more psychodynamically approached than it would be, oh, they saw that, okay, uh, versus actually analyzing the data, right? So, uh, and all the, TA, the, 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 uh, the drawing ones and all that all, all kind of like fall into that same ballpark of being more psychodynamically oriented than versus, you know, data oriented. Um, so I'm going to skip past the Rorschach and, and some of these ones you know, the Brickland test and the Ackerman test, they're, they're, they have some, they give you some important data, but they're not, from my perspective, they don't give you the whole picture. They give you a little bit of a picture, give you talking points to investigate is what I look at them as. Um, when we talk about using tests, a lot of people, um, I'm not sure if they have, have been, uh, uh, the evaluations that I've done 733s on, is is that a lot of times I see that people really don't have a very good grasp of testing. They use it, they rely on it, but they don't understand that they've gone beyond the limits of the test. They uh, are, are they're over relying. They're making it the, the information they gathered on it that this is now the holy grail. Uh, it's not designed to be that. It's designed to give you a, 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 a look at something, and you need to then try to figure out does that fit. Okay, and they don't seem to understand the characteristics of each test. Like I've had ones that use the Codwell, you know, reporting system. Nothing wrong with it, but you have to remember that it makes people look sicker than they are. Okay, they're going to look more severe. That's probably a better word. Sorry, than 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 you're looking at the Pearson ones. You know, and, and you know, for you know, sixty five dollars, you can you too can have the interpretive report from Pearson, if you meet the requirements of being able to do it. So part of what you want to look at is what are you testing for? What I'm looking at is I'm looking to see is there any gross things that are going on that I'm not normally seeing, you know, and, or are they going to validate what I am seeing? And then the other part is, is that you, you have to give the test to both pe- both sides. It's It would be like, you know, it's like trying to do in a custody evaluation and you only evaluated one side, right? I've had, I've seen reports like that. I've actually had to, a report that I had to do, which I, it's say that person refused to participate. This is what this person is. I have nothing to do with custody. This that this is the psychological profile of this person. I can't say anything about custody because I don't know what the other side is. Okay, those are uh, you know you you got to be able to know where you, where you're going with it. Um, more than computer generated, people tend to over generalize the results. Um, so. When, when you're looking at a report, and I think that most of the uh, Miners Council ends up that you guys, you get to see them, you get to read the reports and all that, there's certain things that need to be in a report. So and so that there's a flow that exists. You know, the, the problem with most ones is, is the data does not support the conclusions. Anybody read a report like that? You know, it's like, where'd that come from? Okay, these galaxy things that show up in reports, right? Well, that wasn't part of the data. Where, where, where did that come from? You know, um, so you ha- you have to start with is is that uh, the identity uh, identification information in the beginning of the statement. What is the purpose in the, uh, of the report in the first place? What are you supposed to look at? One of the things that you know uh, um, is uh, you have to be able to get is is getting the judicial officer to write down exactly what what are we looking for? What is it that they want? Because they have an idea of where they want where they want to go, 
and I'm supposed to be helping them gather information. I become the eyes and ears of the court at that point. Where do you want to go? I can go off on this other tangent over here and had nothing to do with what they want. They're like, what? What? Doesn't help. Not helpful. Okay. So you need to be able to. Uh, I outline what it is. That, what are the questions we're going to answer in this report? Okay. Then you want to look at what are the procedures did they go through? And I think that an appropriate re, uh, evaluation needs to have what the procedures are. I outline all of the time that goes on in there, all of the different visits, what happened, uh, and then you go through the, there's a background section. And then there's, needless to say, there's an evaluation of each parent. And there's the evaluation of the children. And then there's the collateral information. Then you need to figure out how to analyze and summarize it to be able to make cogent recommendations, I think. But a lot of times you don't see a lot of that information, all, all those parts involved in a re, an evaluation or a report that you read. That's what is, one should have in it. And that's what's outlined is as part of the requirements of the statutes of the law. So it needs to make sense. It needs to meet the best interest of the child. And that's pretty much how the whole, a whole report should work. So now that we've gone through this one and a half times... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there will be a test now. So, I mean, is there any questions that I can help answer in this? Dr. Sam, I had a question. Um, when I was in private practice years ago, I had a bench officer in a different county. Um, whenever it was suggested that the point of the 730 evaluator say, what are they going to tell me that I haven't already heard before? Um, and so I just wanted to get your um, view of what you can present to the judge that they haven't already heard and maybe a very long, protracted case? Well, I once had a judicial officer in another county. Uh, That's why I don't keep saying that. <laughs> tell me while I was on the witness stand that she completely understood mental health and uh, that anything that I had to say wasn't a, a you know, I already got it. Don't, don't, I don't need to hear it. Now, Evidently, she's a much brighter person than I am because I have a tough time just being a master of the one field that I know. Okay, not alone, multiple fields. Um, I think that when we go back to the first part, which Judge Wells talked about before, is, is that having six minutes per case, and you may have a protracted case and all that, so you get little snippets. Okay, and if I'm going to assume for argument's sake that most judges are human. And uh, human nature is going to be is is that you're going to have you're going to have little tidbits, little snippets of information that are lodged in your head, and you're going to react from those things, which may not be based on logic or anything else. It's most more of an emotional response. If you've had a protracted case being in your courtroom, you're probably a little pissed off in the first place. This person, because 20% of the cases use up 80% of the time in the courtroom, right? So you, you know, and if I've got, I'm looking, I'm, I'm picturing myself as a judge. I have a docket over here of a stack that probably goes from floor to ceiling of cases I got to go through. This, pe These people are kind of here taking my time. I got five days with these people. I'm tired of them, right? I hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I have another friend. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a, another uh, uh, judge tell me at one point as is, is, is we were talking about this issue, he says, I own three ties. And when they find out that I own only three ties, well, they've, they've been in my court way too much. <laughs> okay. So I think what, you're, what we're able to do is this, a, a properly done report should be able to be concise about what the information has gone on, uh, an outline, not in the entire history, because that could be, you know, you know, thousand page reports uh, of their history. But, uh, uh, you know, five, six, ten pages of, of what the history is that's gone on here, how they get where they are. What are the factors that are going through that are inhibiting them from being able to come up with some rational decision? OK, that's what I think the report does for them. It makes it so it's now they don't have to sit there and pry in their mind and think about all the other issues that went on. And, you know, was it like two months ago we were back in here and they had a half a day and person X said this and person Y said that? 
and they're trying to go back through their notes, and maybe they didn't write that down just quite exactly as they would like to. I'm telling you all the things that happened to me, and I'm sure that if I was a judge, it'd be the same. That if I just had a different title, um, so I think that that's what it does. I think it makes it easier for them. You know. You know. I, oh, go ahead. No, but, you know. You, you mentioned, and this is true. The amount of time you have in court is very limited because you have. In, in, in when I was doing it before COVID, we were having like 30 matters on the morning and a trial in the afternoon. And uh, so we, it came down to about five or six minutes per case on an average. And so, but, but the, the preparation time was the afternoon before if the trial went away. If it wasn't, if the trial didn't go away, then it was the night before, you know, after everybody else had gone home. But, but one of the things that I found helpful, and I, I still find it helpful, is when the attorneys are able to write up a kind of a joint statement of what we need. Mm-hmm. Because I may not be able to, I, I may not be able to, in the limited time that I have, to isolate exactly what do I need to know. But you've got two attorneys representing parties who can can write a joint statement of what we need, and I can massage that. If one person says, you know, mom wants to know why dad's being such a jerk or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I can I can massage that to try to in that six minutes. Um, if minors counsel is involved, they can also help us to kind of isolate the the issues, so that if they can present to the judge. A concise statement of this is what we need to know in order to find out what's in the best interest of the child. Then I can put that in order. But trying to get a judge on the fly to do that when they're working with a big calendar is a difficult challenge. So I'd like to say that the attorneys could help a lot. Well, I, I think what you're, you're, you're outlining is is that human nature is is you've got all these different parties and, and people w- will go off on tangents mm-hmm. and, and you're think you're you're paying attention to the tangent and that actually the re- problem is over here not nothing to do with this tangent right but it looks good uh-huh. right. you know and you know we're, we all tend to follow that rabbit sometimes and mm-hmm. when it's over here it's it's I think what a report and and the attorneys it helps the judge be able to focus on where they need to put their attention right you know, it's, it's a tool for them. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is what, you know, if some judge thinks they don't need tools, well, I, I don't know what to say. You know, they're, they're probably not doing their job as well as they should. But as an evaluator, you need to know what it is that the judge needs information about. Mm-hmm. The judge may not have the time to be able to concisely give you what yeah. you need to know to do the report. But if they have input from the attorneys that's, that's cooperative input, I understand some attorneys that aren't cooperative, but even so, what, what I do, what I even do now is I'll tell attorneys, okay, if y'all can't write up a joint statement, then each of you write up your own statement, and I'll make the, I'll make the, the I'll put them together, I'll meld them. Um, even in criminal, I do that. So I think something like that could be a, a great help to the judge and a great help to you to help you focus on what, what does the judge think is the issue that needs to be addressed in this report. One thing I always like is seeing all the data because the more is that is included in the 730, the less likely you're going to have a, um, a 733 mm-hmm. attacking and trying to dismantle that 730. Right. The other thing I think uh, Terrence has mentioned that a 730 does is the child, the attorney, nobody ever sees the child except for us. Mm-hmm. And many times, parents are fighting, but they don't recognize that what they're fighting about and blaming each other, the child's got a problem. Uh Or they're fighting about stuff, and I think we can help the judge understand who this child is, because sometimes children and parents are mismatched, Uh and that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. But sometimes parents, one parent is yelling like, this is the right way to help the parent, and they're yelling, this is the w- right way, and neither one's wrong. Mm-hmm. So you have to, the judge, and someone's got to be able to represent who the child is, mm-hmm. because that's what we're doing the report about. Right. And we're the only ones that see the child. Mm-hmm. Or minors counsel, mm-hmm. if minors mm-hmm. counsel is involved. But attorneys aren't supposed to right. see the kids. No. No. Attorneys don't yeah. see them. Judges don't see them. Mediators don't usually see them. I mean, mm-hmm. most of your cases, mm-hmm. you know. So we're the only ones. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. I, mean, I have a case uh, with an eight-year-old child uh, that I just finished up that that child has learned that he tells a story. He, he is he is he's a bright kid, 
but he's and he's learned how to tell mom the story that mom wants to hear and he tells dad the story that dad wants to hear and he is really really good at selling that story okay cuz i i mean you know i I've, I've heard a million and a one of those stories and i'm sitting there going oh it's that oh until i kind of got caught in, i got both sides going on at the same time in both both ears to figure out how he was manipulating the situation okay and i think that that's the stuff that you don't get in the six minutes or the pro track you know one of the things that i'm always amazed at is it to take you have six days or five days of court time you, you really get only a very smidgen of time actually dealing with the issues because we got all these side things we have to do no this is we're do, you know and we have you know all legal things that have to be resolved that takes up three quarters of the time it seems like maybe i'm exaggerating a little bit maybe it's only half but it seems like it takes up a lot of the time right and i would if i was sitting in the judge's chair i think i would get uh get confused about where where were we how did we get here? But well, we're fighting about that, okay? All right, let's get back over here. Where where were we and how did that apply to what we were doing? Because you probably had a train of thought going on before you went off on that tangent that had to, oh, this is a legal point that we have to talk about mm -hmm. and resolve it. Oh, well, now i got to figure out what the answer to that legal point is because mm -hmm. they're the ones that make the decision of whether that legal point goes this way or that way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh.